<laughs> All right, let's begin. Hello, everyone. I hope you are enjoying your Sunday as I am, as we are. Uh, thank you for being with us at the KL Startup Summit. For the last three days, we've been having insightful talk, interactive panel discussion and masterclass workshop. But right here, right now, you're tuning in inside the FinTech track, the fourth, which is also the last panel session for the day. And our topic is driving corporate innovation at scale in the financial services industry. I have me our fellow esteemed speaker, um, Ganesh, Head of Innovation from Irish B, Jan, uh, CEO of our Leaderpreneur. Um, I also have Lawrence, Managing Partner from Duxton Consulting Group, Azim, who is an Innovation Strategist from Alpha Cash, and last but not least, Mark Leo, Head of Customer Experience from Hong Leong Bank. So let's begin. Um, our topic today is driving corporate innovation at scale. And the notion of a, right? The notion of digital transformation is now fairly advanced with many organizations working on transforming businesses over the last two years, if not more. COVID, for instance, have forced companies to take radical steps to adopt technology advancement, modernized culture, looking at restructure of the organization, new measurement system operating, you name it, right? And with the uncertainty, with the uncertainty and the rapid change of the market, companies have to be continually prepared to change and take calculated and be prepared to fail fast or their business is likely to get disrupted. And therein lies the spur in innovation, which have become a top priority for many companies. So my first question to the panelists, what is your definition to digital transformation and innovation? And is a difference? If I can hear from Lawrence or anyone on the ground. I think Lawrence is experiencing some audio problem. Mm. Yeah, yeah. We're, I think Lawrence is having some audio pr problem. Anyone else think, from the panel? I think it's back. So you're just coming back on. OK. Yeah. Oh, we can hear you. Lawrence, you're back in. Um, so is it question one? Yes, question one. What okay, is um, your definition, so for Lawrence? Me, um, innovation and digital um, transformation is a bit different. Uh, so for me, innovation or digital in innovation is when you realize an idea that's in the head and you put it into reality that's innovation so you you achieve progress you you uh, you do something that was possible before that to me is innovation or when you look at tra digital transformation that could i mean that's of course also digital transformation but digital transformation is also when you just take something that's currently offline and and done in a different way and you just make it digital not necessarily making a huge improvement just to, to have the whole journey done um then that would capture that as well. So I think that's kind of the difference here, at least to me. Uh, so it's very important that innovation equals progress and something really different that wasn't possible before. I'd like to add on further what uh, Lawrence has mentioned. It's just not about you introducing something which is not done before. It's something that the, val the customer value and is willing to buy from you. Because if you introduce something of value, your competitor introduces the same. There's no sustainable value for you uh, as an innovator. Right, right. So not just new, but creation of value, right? Uh, that's what innovation to you. Anyone else would like to yeah. add on to that? How right, do you what, differentiate between yeah. digital transformation mm -hmm. and innovation? All right, for me, let's talk about digital transformation first, right? So this could be, you know, when you implement new employee roles, you know, software, hardware, um, as a service option, where it, you know, it could be it could include cloud computing, um, automation, and agile processes in a combination dramatically changes your business operating model. Where else, when you look at innovation, is is a sort of a net needle mover, right? It could be a new idea, method, product, service, um, profit model, or process. Or process, you know, it challenges existing norms. Um, it it can be the use of improved solutions to you know meet require meet requirements of market needs. So you know, um, you know, one can lead to another, but you know, it, it could work both ways as well. So that's that's how I view it. Perfect. I like yeah, I'd like to add on. I, I think what uh, Lauren said uh, at the very start, it's actually very true. It's actually taking an idea and actually making a change. And that's what innovation is. But uh, as you know, we've spoken a lot about the differences between both uh, digital transformation and innovation. I think in terms of similarities, they are both cycles. It means that you know it's always never ending. Digital transformation, if you would think, it's uh, not you know a five-year plan, but it's always constant. And same with innovation. Innovation is always constant. You keep on having to going through that cycle because you know change is what 
drives us forward. And that's what really what matters uh, in that. Yeah, okay. and innovation is not always the, techno the technology that's being used or created, right? It's what results yeah. from that technology and how to solve pre-existing problems. Okay, so it's very interesting. You talk about value creation, you talk about it can be new, it can be improved or different ways of doing, but you talk about constant, right? And this, to a certain extent, makes me think whether innovation, could innovation be a way of working or an end outcome? Because if the outcome is the transformation that an organization desire, could it be that innovation is actually the input that actually constant, right? But we know for sure that innovation, I think we all agree, all about value creation, either improve or new, and thus, of course, can also be further down, uh, broken down further by types of innovation. Let's take this up a notch. I guess my next question is, you know, there's so many types of innovation and there's so many, you know, type of organization that is also doing innovation. Who is, in your opinion, innovates better? Corporates or startup? Maybe Jan, haven't heard from you. Hi, yes. Um, I think that what we are going to see is the reconceptualization of what the organization actually means. When we differentiate between startup and corporation, I, I, I think we're on the right track, but where industry 4.0 will go is I don't think we'll see that anymore. I don't think we're going to see in 20 years, 30 years, an environment where there's a corporate and a startup. We're going to see a very different approach. Um, and what we're seeing is that transition into that new world. So uh, to answer your question, I think what really differentiates is the extraordinary ability to engage in industry 4.0 thinking. Do you care? Do you engage? Do you humble yourself and listen and learn and move with aggression? Do you move at the speed of trust or the speed of process? And you can see, of course, you know, many notable startups that have come to conquer the world, but we can also note giants like Microsoft who've transformed themselves and become, I think Microsoft was the second trillion dollar company. Um, they were struggling, you know, earlier this, um, you know, in the early decade. So, so I think it's really about being able to embrace big new thinking. Uh, and part of the challenge there is whether the, um, the state of consciousness is available within the organization. Is the senior leaders, the middle and the front line, are they all synchronized in a higher state of consciousness to, to operate at high levels of capability? Um, or are they stuck in the status quo? And, and basically what that means, I think, in plain English is, do you move at the speed of your process? Do you, or do you move at the speed of trust in your organization? Are you really able to open your and minds and go for it? Or do you have to check everything and everyone has to verify everything? You know, a great example of that is a lot of organizations um, believe that the idea is that you have to go to your senior to ask them, is it okay to do this innovation? And then they ask their up, right? Yes. And, and, and this really has very little to do with the fact of whether the innovation is useful or not, right? Because mm -hmm. the people who know in many ways the least of what's going on are the people at the top because they're the furthest away from the battlefield. Right, the front line know who what's going knows what's going on. The reason we're asking is because we don't trust each other, and therefore we have to trust in order to be able to to secure permission and prevent political fallout if things go wrong. So, creating an environment in an organization where you can move at the speed of trust, appropriately mm -hmm. scoping out risk, um, allocating resources in, in, in smart, effective ways, creates a completely different organization. So, I think what we're going to see is a hybrid, uh, and really moving to the organization being more of a platform. Um, an environment in which you can operate in, you come in and you have permission to use resources and work within that space. But um, but I don't think it'll be just a traditional organization. So hybrid is my answer. <laughs> nice. I think that's a fantastic uh, explanation because corporate or startup, and you mentioned that it's not about being a corporate or a startup, they would do well if they have that state of consciousness, challenge their way of thinking and constantly, you know, approach different way and, and pursue it without actually having to ask your senior about it, right? And actually push on for any value creation that makes sense for the organization and keep redef redefining as well what the organization is all about. Beautiful. Um, anyone else? So uh, can I just jump in because I'm back on. Uh, I haven't heard what anybody yes. has said, but I'm very passionate about this point. So I would like to say something about it. So, um, so for me, uh, it's clearly that in a startup environment, the innovation will happen so much more likely, so much more faster, so much more better. I've worked with so many different clients where corporate uh, culture and all uh, processes and everything gets in the way because for a very, very simple reason, when you are working within the same environment, where the margins of the existing offline product are much higher than those that you can generate in the beginning when you innovate something. You will always be second rated when it comes to resources, when it comes to uh, leadership time or any of that. And I've seen so many uh, really big projects failing because of that. 
So, and, and we all know uh, when you look at Kodak, I remember in the 90s, they always knew that the phone was the next thing for photography, but they were never able to do it because they never stepped out of the environment. And I think it's almost deadly. So I, I was uh, on the on the back end from Jan hearing a hybrid. I hear that if there's a platform enabling and all that, yes. But I'm, uh, yeah, otherwise it's, it's really, really tough. I'd like to add on. I, I think uh, from a fintech perspective, I'm really excited that the fintech companies in Malaysia are doing uh, very well. They're really good at introducing uh, new stuff. For example, my favorite app, uh, Jong Parking, makes life easy. But my worry is that startups are good at introducing innovation, but many of them are not sustainable and many of them are not uh, profitable in the long run. So this is where I see like it should be a hybrid introduction would be by a startup but to carry forward, you, the startup need to either be acquired or move into a professional managed organization. They need to grow up, then they are sustainable in the long term. Thank you. I like what Azim said. Uh, sorry, if you don't mind me just Go, go for it. No, no, yeah. I, I absolutely like what Azim said. I, I guess if you look at both uh, these two entities, right, the corporation as well as the startup startups, in essence, in its very true essence of what is a startup, is that they are actually there purely to innovate. Innovate meaning that you know you have to create a new market for yourself or you're going to challenge someone. And then by doing so, you actually really have to think out of the box, try to find ways and then build something new that's going to be, you know, to basically disrupt the corporations, right? Otherwise, you know, what's the whole point of it? I mean, that's the true essence of it. But when it comes to a corporation or so as well, uh, to them, they may have uh, different side, whether it is from, you know, from the development side all the way until to product launch and then to operate it or basically to support it. Their innovations will be very different throughout there because they may be focusing a, li a little bit more on supply chain. They'll be innovating their supply chain. You know, I've already launched this product. I'm going to cut costs throughout uh, over year on year, you know, to find ways. How do I streamline these processes? And also it's a little bit kind. Uh, I guess it's a very different way of how they would be focusing on innovation rather as compared to you know, launching new products, new ways, new things. And so what Azim says, it's correct because, you know, when you look at sustainability, then it's also a different kind of like innovation. And you need to innovate ways on how to maintain your business model and to keep it sustainable. Or I'm just going to jump in with a contrarian view. You know, I mean, I, I think it's important to first ascertain, talk about, we talk about innovation, but if you want to talk about startup failure, it's a separate topic, right? But if you analyze the, the data, most of the reason why it fails is because it doesn't really achieve product market fit, right? It was a good idea. They launched it quickly. And, but the price of failure was so low in terms of time, in terms of resources, you know. Um, so I wouldn't use that as a barometer to say that, you know, startups fail, you know, you know because they don't have that corporate, you know, structure. They wouldn't have been startups if, if they weren't, um, you know, starting from a particular pain point to validate it, right? It's just that they didn't hit you know, product, product market fit. I think for me, when I look at, you know, when you look at who innovates better, you have to look at it from a, from a talent perspective, right? And if you wonder why, you know, Gen Z talent, I know a lot of people have their opinions about this. So I, I talked about this in my keynote yesterday, right? Some of the core values of the new generation right now is embracing failure, right? They believe it will help them become more innovative. They're comfortable to take on new risk. Number two, they have a curious and open mindset. Number three, they value ethics and social impact. You know, at number four, they value diversity. And if you think about these four components right now, I spoke about diversity, I talked about ethics and social impact, curious and open mindset, embracing failure. These are the ingredients that make innovation happen, right? And 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 part of what I feel in the end state that Jan described really well about how this hybrid would work is when, when you, you see this baby boomer generation slowly, you know, um, retiring and you have this new generation, the future workforce, right? And, and I think the question is, from a corporate perspective, how are you going to um, craft your value proposition? How are you going to craft your uh, proposition to attract this, this talent pool? You know, so I think there's only so much you can do. You can build the best operating model. You can integrate the best um, activities to support innovation. Uh, but you need to have that, that hunger, right? That needs to come from somewhere. And that comes from enablement. That comes from very strong incentives, incentives to promote innovation. You know, which I think would, you know, is something I think we'll be covering at some point. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's my two cents on that. Nice. Okay. So 
that was really interesting hearing from everyone. So some of the things that I picked up, right? You talk about like some some had the view that startup might actually be um, innovating much better than corporation because we know many startups come in the market very often disruptively and they do well very early. But also, of course, uh, there are a lot of cases they die very quickly as well. Um, and if we were to take a step back in the and look at the type of innovation, right? There is increment breakthrough and disruptive. Uh, type of innovation. So unlike big corporation, we know startups also don't do really well on the first two, but corporate does. That's why they also don't scale. But Apple, for example, who's not a startup, but innovate at vast scale. And the question was why, right? So which, what could that be? And you guys spoke a lot around, the, it, it's a hybrid model. That's the, the reconceptualization of organization because the importance is not whether it's a corporate type like by size or a startup type by size, but rather is the organization cult purpose and the leadership, having that leadership that embrace experimentation, people who are just highly curious and empowered to do it, to, to do innovation, right? And this brings us to the next question just perfectly. With culture and purpose, innovation is set in organization, large organization especially, is struggling, trying to figure out how to run innovation. And metrics and KPI, as we all know, are often key, not often all the time, are key to any corporation. And in the practice of innovation, many questions on the accounting and the ROIs of it, the, the return of investment is allow, which also in a way allow innovators in an organization to indicate whether you're doing enough the activities or you need more specifically enough of the right kind of activities as well to actually achieve your result. So I guess my next that clearly leads me to my next question. How is innovation measured in your organization or how should it be measured if you think there is still some improvement that should be done? Anyone? I, I can start. I think back in 2011, uh, we were hired by the government to encourage our state-owned enterprise, the GLC, to innovate. So one of the biggest issues is at uh, board level. So when we look at it, uh, one of the key metrics of an innovation is to be able to calculate how much money that you put in and what was the return from an, a tangible and uh, intangible perspective. So you, it's actually from an accounting standard, that's actually an ACCA paper which outlines how do you do that, but not many companies are doing it. A uh, second measure is how well is a corporate, especially public listed company is doing in terms of innovation management, is they are reporting their project pipeline. What is my projection for my innovation projects in the next three years, five years, uh, 10 years? Uh, one of the clients that we work with, they actually had to repair their projection for innovation for 15 years because they are in plantation. Replanting genomic takes a long time. So a measure of success uh, would be if you are telling your story right and the investor believe in your innovation story, buying your shares, waiting for your uh, innovation to be uh, fruitful. So it's a mix of a leading indicator, uh, project pipelines, etc., and the actual okay. results and profit. If it's not transferred into profits or an intang intangible assets, market share, or a brand value, then it's not innovation. What I see now is a trend called innovation theater. We're doing a lot of activities saying that we are planning to innovate. We are doing A, B, C, D, but in the end, it's not translated to your bottom line, either three to five years uh, down the line. Okay, right. so bottom line result. That's how you would measure innovation. Anyone else? All right, I'm happy to just pipe in here. Um, yeah. Just, um, so for us, I mean, we look at it, you know, you have input measures, uh, you have out, output measures, and you have outcome measures, right? Which is a mixture of, you know, leading to lagging indicators. Um, so for us, you know, of course, we we also have our theater, you know, we have all the different types of initiatives we're doing from, you know, um, um, from our solution innovation labs to uh, a new funding mechanism, uh, Shark Tank equivalent, you know, to to hackathons and you know the usual innovation theater, um, but for us, it's very it's very strategic. Um, when we identify these sort of um, problem statement, this has, has been this comes from the uh, from the entire team, uh, not only from the top level, from the medium. We actually do a, a proper lunch mapping session, and and there's very specific output. This is leading back to your organizational strategy. There's alignment there, um, and then in terms of the outcomes. It's very tangible. You have to build a business case, and it is something that can be tested on a very small scale, and, and it's something which we we actually track. So we track all, um, for example, MVP releases 
in the bank mm. bank wide and for every single release they need it needs to have the the releases are prioritized based on a value effort you know urgency matrix and it is then uh quantified in terms of um output whether it's you know cost reduction or or revenue uplift or reduced churn rate a uh, number of new customers acquired whatever it may be and 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 that comes back to your overall um uh, overall metrics which you're targeting right which is faster turnaround time you know productivity metrics and and this is also measured using the same model you know input output outcome measures so tangible metrics are both input and output yeah right? and this is the qualitative and quantitative so is all right all right yan i saw you on mute just now would you like to say, add add on to that yeah i think it's it's a tricky conversation right because um it's operating at multiple levels at at leaderpreneur um part of being a leaderpreneur is that you need to be able to calculate your innovation methodology and there's different ways to do that but basically we look at a two year horizon with a 60% discount factor built in um but beyond that i think what's actually more important is to talk about the credibility of the valuation and why that is a believable amount and i think what can be inspiring there is the scientific community and using the peer review process so it doesn't matter that i say it's worth 100000 what matters is that maybe Ganesh and, and Lawrence and Azim and Mark and maybe yourself all agree it is 100,000 that's much more important um and the re- the way we get to that consensus is by building conversation and building consensus right and making sense of the the project making sense of the value the risk etc 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 so it's not so much that you have a number it's the which you've got to that number in a stakeholder environment so if you release a peer review if you new publish a paper you have to go through a peer review process and that is anonymously reviewed by other um experts in your field right and so that is what enables it to achieve a uh, publication so i think this sort of social proof of work is extremely extremely important and um is a way of addressing the inherent uncertainty in innovation and then of course it's about realizing that value is a journey that you know we might say it's 100,000 now but maybe next quarter we have to come back to it and say actually now it's only 75,000 and maybe this quarter it goes up to 150 and that there's always going to be that variability and that's part of the, un- the mature understanding of value that it, that it fluctuates okay so that's very interesting so you are actually measure the proof of work itself and how the number is actually you know um de- being derived from and then only you then further track how that is realized right um anyone else would like to add to this or i will move to the next one i think we no. have yeah yeah i can just add a little bit i guess uh sure. from, I guess from my point or my based on my experience when working it i definitely agree with uh, the guys here especially when we first started uh, you know talking about you know talent pool and all uh i think sometimes when we do too much stringent things like for example you know you need to uh do a lot of paperwork you need to you know find your ROI you need to get measured but i think where we we realize that based on the talent pool or with the resources that we have uh, how we do measure it is basically based on you know how many hypotheses and experiments can you actually just perform we don't really care whether you know does it work does it doesn't work but our aim initial aim is actually more towards can you challenge the norm today can you challenge the most horrid word which i don't really like which is to say this is bau can we challenge the bau can we think of new ways and it's what we're trying to imprint uh within our staff and uh, within our, our group so that you know that by the time the moment comes for a really large uh, you know idea that they really want to put they're so used to you know going through the cycles of saying hey okay it doesn't work i will start forming more and more hypotheses and keep going through uh this each of the ideas and trying to make change right so to us uh, how we measure is most uh very early stages but most mostly you know how many hypotheses have you thought of and actually try to prove or disprove them so yeah that's on my side here yeah just to add on to what mark mentioned yeah you know i think that that the clear distinction between you know you know testing new hypotheses and bau it needs to be distinct but you know i think what we what we did at um rhb i think the first step we did was actually to implement it right so right now when we talk about sprint goals and and you know your 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 daily stand ups that that is actually part of bau and then innovation is then then comes in after so so for us it was like first first step was to build and transform you know where we implement all across you know retail group business and and group technology which includes you know enhanced empowerment to make funding decisions um you know implementing new performance evaluation as an example before moving to scale and fortify 
so which is essentially continuing transformation of key functional groups um, and wholesale business, enhancing you know key agile enablers in particular, you know institutionalizing design thinking, for example, you know enhancing key internal processes. So it's not just like all right, we're agile, we're doing design thinking, but oh, we're still in compliance. No, we need to completely you know change that and introduce innovations. Like in our bank, um, you know all the management committee members have innovation KPIs embedded, and it's cascaded one down and two down. So now I get calls every so often from a business saying, hey, Ganesh, what, what's an MVP? Because they haven't been flipped yet, you know, uh, to, to, to Agile. And, and for me, I think that is amazing because now people are talking about it. Now everyone in the organization, people at branches now learning what incremental innovation is and implement changes. So I think that is, you know, having a unified understanding of what innovation means is super critical in order to have a, a in order to scale innovation, yeah. All right. Very interesting. Very, very interesting. Heard so many things around uh, measures and metrics that you are all adopting, both input and output, both you know tangible and intangible, both qualitative and quantitative. But in Bach, if I were to really understand inputs from all the speakers here, you talk about metrics around cap building capabilities. You talk about talent, retaining talent. You talk about the practice itself, how you measure that practice, right? That's the hypothesis building and the experimentation itself. And then the realization of the investment and, and proofing that work, that, that numbers, right? And, and if I gather this correctly, and if as per what we've spoken about innovation from the beginning, right? If innovation is a process and a journey, I guess too much measure could kill innovation, right? Yeah, so I, let's let's move on to the next topic, uh, not next topic, but next iteration that I would like to hear from the panelists. So, um, la, cop, uh, like organization are trying to adopt uh, innovation and 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 technology, for instance, are truly key enablers, right? Uh, but. And, to, and, and of course, why? Because technology have continued to drive innovation across business models in various industries, especially fintech, um, financial services, allowing new businesses to enter the market and disrupt incumbents in serious ways. So in order to drive business growth, we have to stay around changing time. So I'd like to hear from our you know, experts uh, panel here today, okay, if you can share some of the key trends in the financial services that we have today and, and soon in the near future. Lawrence, maybe I haven't heard. We haven't heard much, Lawrence. Calling me out. You're calling yeah. me out. That's great. Um, so, so to me, one of the key trends, um, especially coming also from China, but I think in general is, is I think it's automation, um, where things are just happening uh, in the background. With uh, I mean, I think everybody's been talking about this for ages in terms of in terms of credit rating, and 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 whatnot, especially for the finance uh, sector. And now we see all these kind of different platforms from China coming um, and having most of this actually built in and accelerating at, at massive speed uh, and, and their business. So I think automation is, is very big, of course, based on data, based on, on access of data. Uh, to me, not only in a, in a fintech, but also in general is, is, is a key trend um, to just throw that. Can I add on something so that later Mark and Ganesh can give their comment? Because I've been, from a consumer perspective, banking is, has disappointed me tremendously. I've used brands from Singapore, from Malaysia, and uh, the biggest area is that many banks are not looking at uh, UX, UI for uh, enterprise user, uh, consumer user. There's no analytics. I wish that banks uh, software similar to uh, what you call that, my Spotify or my Grab. So it, it uses my data to help me make my investment decision. Tell me what can, how can I save money better? There are prototypes out there. It's been five years of conversations. As consumer, I'm disappointed. Last comment, my only excitement in banking was, I think, 20 years ago when I opened a bank account with Filio Elite Bank, where I went in Nusa to a booth where I opened up my account uh, virtually. That was exciting, uh, innovative. So that's the only excitement I see in banking. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Azim, for that. Now, let's hear a bit more from the banks. <laughs> you want to take maybe. that first? <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> yes, no, 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 I'll definitely take that. I think that uh, it's, a, it's definitely a fair point. Uh, it's 
one that we constantly uh, you know look towards. But from what maybe first, let me answer the question, right? So what do I see in trends? Uh, two things. Uh, on the back end, we see applied intelligence uh, being used more and more, uh, meaning, you know, uh, from what I think Lauren said, from automation to AI to data, and then letting it all run uh, at the back end. So that at the front end, uh, to the customers, it's going to be a lot more personalized. So I see trends going towards a uh, better personalization, uh, similar to what uh, I think Azim was asking for, you know, for us to recommend things for him, for us to, you know, tell him what should he do with his investments and all, uh, and that. And to achieve that, of course, uh, it's definitely one that I do believe, I think a, a lot of the banks in Malaysia are working hard to get towards there. There are a lot of, uh, there are a lot of hurdles and steps that we are trying uh, very hard to work out through and trying to, so trying to well, solve some of the, some technical issues as well as some process issues. So yes, it's definitely coming to me. I will say that, uh, but yeah, just be patient with us. Yeah, let me let me just add on to that. I mean, you know, that's that's a great point because uh, so I, I I remember joining the bank in uh, September fairly recent, and you know I think the first thing was you know really looking at the UI UX. You know I think that was something that was key, and and actually that is what we're actually doing. You know, so if you if you go to our jobs portal, you're going to see a lot of jobs available for UI UX designers, <laughs> and that is something we're actively prioritizing, mm -hmm. not just that uh, business design product design, um, and and part of that. Uh, entire proposition is actually reimagining our entire hiring experience, mm -hmm. right? You know, um, so for example, if you go to DBS, you can actually just you know submit an application in five minutes. You know, maybe they have you know lesser requirements by their regulatory authority, um, but there's no reason why you know banks in Malaysia cannot do the same, mm -hmm. right? And and that is something we're we're actually act actively looking at. You know, creating a very compelling value proposition to attract the right type of talent. You know, uh, because the best product designers, uh, they don't view, um, you know, banks as it's not aligned with their values, not aligned with their, their mission. And, and maybe we're not communicating a compelling value proposition uh, to this talent. But that is something we're definitely looking at. So you will be seeing better looking products um, overall. Um, on, the, on the other side, we're also looking at, you know, open banking. That is one area where really uh, it's really important to us, you know, because that will uh, eliminate a lot of um, um, internal systems. You'll be able to have more strategic partnerships with various partners to to uh, to iterate more compelling propositions for the end consumer. So, you know, I think we're, we are there. Uh, we're trying to move uh, the needle. And as a customer, you might only see this in the next 12, 12 months or so. But yeah, we'll get there. Yes, definitely. Yeah, I, I, we definitely did uh, totally agree. And uh, a lot of banks also we started uh, learning the importance of that as well. As well. So, like for me, so I have like uh, of uh, UX guys also underneath, um, you know, working with me. And then we are constantly looking at ways not just to improve whatever uh, new, but we also trying to look at ways to improve what's out, already out there. And constantly trying to find ways to constantly uh, help our customers and to make it a lot more convenient for them. All right, I hope we didn't start too defensive there. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that, that's very interesting. So as we take a more customer view, right, customer will continue to demand more due to the changing needs with financial services, right? And today, I guess if I were to take a customer view and, and as a customer, right, I look at the market today in terms of financial services, with the fintech today, we have over a million, a million e-wallets in the market and mobile payment, for example, which makes bank exist in the palm of people's hand. And you also pointed out on the workforce today, if we look at that, they mostly don't take a full-time job. The economy, right, will continue to change how people accumulate, save and invest wealth, right? So the disruptive yeah. influence of fintech is definitely tremendous. We all know that. Um, this brings me to the, my next question. What is your view on the impact to the business environment? Of course, it's the banks and also the social economic lives of people. If I can hear that from maybe Jan. Hi there. Yes, I think um, financial services are in such a privileged position because they can make a huge impact on the well-being of a people, right? The rakyat and the state and its future. And I think what we have arrived at is the end the paradigm limit of the traditional industry 3.0 banking model. And we are transitioning from the horse to the car. And historically, no horse breeders, which were some of the largest companies in the world, became car companies. So what financial services face is an existential crisis that they are not familiar with. Um, on the other hand, that's a huge opportunity for the people to really be empowered by effective financial services. And um, I think to restore trust, 
to restore good governance and restore the ability to actually uh, believe in the fact that we can build a better world using financial services, not just be lost in frustrating processes. So I think the first thing to kind of emphasize for, for consumers is that they are part of the innovate or die reality. By the end of this decade, within five years, and certainly by the end of this decade, there will be large financial institutions we all know that do not exist anymore. Ten years ago, most of us still had Blackberries and Nokias. We don't anymore. And it's happening right now. Um, I've been able to see some of the things coming through on blockchain. Of course, we all say words of this, but it's, it's breathtaking because you remove the bank completely. There is no need for a bank in the same way that Spotify removes the need for a record store. So how to, how to engage with that and transform with that. Um, and I think the opportunity for financial institutions is to recognize the patterns of the past and not, not, not um, be victim to them, but to learn from those lessons and to grow forward in, with them. I think the second challenge for the traditional organization is this. If you do 100% business as usual, you're 100% going to die. But everyone is stuck doing business as usual. And there's a lot of reasons for that. And there's regulated profit. I, I get it. But in the end, you're still going to die, right? So recalibrating that, I think, is the number one priority for senior leaders today. That is, it, that's what it comes down to. Where are your people spending your time? Even more than important than money. And then thirdly, I think in terms of um, why people are embracing these trustless technologies is we're moving into the age of no, zero trust. Like I don't trust anything any bank ever tells me, full stop, like zero. I have zero trust in anything that anyone ever tells me. And I think what that view is, is really the view of, of a new generation, um, the, the millennials. And bear in mind that millennials are 70% of ASEAN. And I think what we see is an opportunity there to restore trust um, by working with trustless technologies that you can use blockchain and these kinds of things. And that is going to drive massive adoption and it's going to be very, very, very fast. It's already reaching that sort of what I would call the uh, the terminator point where it, it goes so fast that, you know, to compare it to someone like Nokia versus Apple, Nokia was still alive, but it was clear that Apple had kind of got ahead. So these are classic case studies, and I think there's a wonderful opportunity to learn from them. Every situation is different, but I think the broad trend is still there. Um, and I think it's also exciting for Malaysia because there's a lot of very talented people in this country with a lot of great ideas, empowered with technology and you know conferences like this. Um, I think this can be a really exciting place. Thank you. Anyone else would like to add on your view on the impact of innovation to the business environment, the, the new fintech that's taking over the market? Yeah, I mean, I, I can just add a little bit now, right? So if you look at the market, you know, it's known for its, you know, cutting edge technology, um, you know, working towards creating really tailor-made solutions for end users um, and consumers. But I think the biggest impact, which for me, I think it's it's pretty awesome, is the enhanced reachability, right? Is making this concept of financial services more accessible. And that is what has sort of rallied uh, this movement around fintech companies, you know, especially from those from the, you know, the lower tier, of the income scale and 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 you know because even in part of our design labs right we we, we conducted we heard a lot of if a lot of smes come to us and say hey when i really needed a bank loan you know i didn't qualify for it but all of a sudden when i'm doing well that's when banks come calling in right where were you when i was starting out right and, and there's always that disconnect because i remember when i first joined a bank having been in the startup scene for the last half decade of my life and everyone was like wow Ganesh you're a trader you're selling your soul you know that was the perception right the banks are evil and you know then they're not very wrong you look at what's happening in America to a certain extent so I think it's become sort of a bit of a class warfare as well you know um, and, and that is something that um, uh, you know, I think banks have taken note of of this perception that people have and and which is why we're down on you know um, you know foundations you know corporate social um, activities, as well as, you know, being more customer centric, being more user centric, showing that you actually care for the end consumer. And, and that is only something that is going to happen over time. And I think, you know, based on at least our NPS scores, things have been going well in the last three years, it's been progressively going up. And, and that's what I think we in the banking sector should focus on, you know, really embrace this. This is only good. This is only going to be good for the end consumer. So that, that's my view. I'll add on my, my view. A few last year we did work Lawrence, for. Music. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Uh, last year I, I did a piece of work yes, for Ministry can. of Health to regulate uh, online healthcare. Uh, one of the biggest gap on online healthcare is insurance doesn't cover. It's a lot of opportunities for uh, fintech uh, in that area. But at the same time, what I saw with fintech 
is about democratization services. For example, I know this case where certain foundation, they want to work with Islamic based uh, payment system, etc. So my point is that for the fintech industry to flourish in Malaysia, we, we, the ecosystem uh, needs to uh, work together to avoid uh, two things. Uh, number one is to avoid uh, to avoid monopoly because it's really happening for certain sector uh, where uh, data is controlled uh, by a specific entity. And secondly, is to think of uh, unintended consequences of any particular activity. What if this particular entity becomes a monopoly or what if that particular fintech company uh, collapses, what would the consequences be? So I think Malaysia needs to think it uh, strategically because there's a lot of opportunity, but if it fails, it is the people at the lower rung, people in the gig economy, yeah. the small traders are the one uh, suffering. So that's uh, that's my point of view. Anyone else would like to add to that? Lawrence? Um, yeah, um, I would like to challenge um, our guys from the banks here a little bit. I, I would li like to go back to the scenario that Jan was kind of putting out very, uh, very nicely. And I, I absolutely buy into what he's saying. And, and if you are running a bank these days, you should actually look at this and be scared, right? And, um, and, and then, I, and then that, so that's one. But two, then you see the banks are still making massive profits. Uh, so there's a lot of cash. There's a lot of money. But all I'm hearing what the banks are doing is incremental uh, little things that have to generate uh, bottom line results within a year or two. Um, and and I, I feel there is a, there's a disconnect. Um, so if I was you know, learning from the past what happened and, and understanding what the scenario could be, and I'm making these profits, I would take at least half of these profits, if not more, and go out there and be much bolder and be much more daring uh, uh, in terms of trying to turn this around, knowing that this is coming. And I, I don't see it. Maybe it's, it's because I, I'm currently not working. Oh, actually, I do work with the bank, but it's, uh, it's very specific. So I just don't see it uh, really happening. And I would like to hear from our guys if that's true. And, and if that's true, why is that? All right, let, let me jump in. I mean, fantastic observation. I mean, I, I think that is a, is a key method, right? So how, let me just give you an example of how we actually uh, define innovation. So we use this, uh, you know, Gary Pisano model where there's four buckets based on whether it's a new business model, so y-axis and new technology competencies, your x-axis, right? So, you know, you have incremental innovation, you have disruptive innovation, you have radical innovation, architectural innovation. And so what we've done is that's how we've bucketed it. So everyone has a shared understanding of means. And, you know, and last year, for example, most of our efforts were on incremental innovation because it's still new, right? We're still introducing the concept of, you know, making change. And, and for a bank, this is still, this is considered pretty much, right? And the moment they see these wins and, and, and they start believing in, wow, innovation can actually happen. Squads are believing it. And, and because that's our goal. We want to hit a critical mass of innovators, right? And, and are we there yet? No, we're not. Right. But this year, the emphasis has been on committing to a X number of breakthrough innovations. Right. And, and that is something we have actually set up stealth squads. Um, and these stealth squads are dedicated squads. Their sole purpose is to identify new opportunities of breakthrough innovation. And these squads are protected Like we protect them from any influence, from any um, barriers. Um, we have a team dedicated to just, you know, whatever barriers you face, we will solve it for you. And that is one of uh, the approaches we're doing. And then for core functions of the bank, we have also, um, we have, I'm, I'm running a few uh, innovation labs with these core functions, right? Very specific pain points, very specific um, objectives. And, and some of these are not like an immediate horizon. We're looking at a mid to long term horizon. But I think it's about making the right bets. So, you know, a simple, I think Google's model is the 70, 20, 10. You know, McKinsey's has, you know, the three horizons of growth, you know, and, and around the same kind of principles. And that is how we have sort of bucketed our innovation strategy. We have a few like, you know, long term stuff, which mm -hmm. we don't know what's going to happen. We have some that we we see something could happen in maybe three, three to five years. And then we have a lot with, which is in looking at a more 12 month to 24 month horizon. So that's how we have approached it. Um, of course, uh, this is something we've approached now. So you will only start seeing these things um happening in the in the, the next three to five years yeah 
Yeah, uh, to, I totally agree with uh, Ganesh. So, uh, I mean, as a bank uh, from banks, so it takes a while for us to move. Uh, got a lot of things uh, from legacy systems to quite a number of you know all applications that we're always trying to say you know how can we always do things better. So same thing, we have our moonshots. We have a few experiments, um, hypotheses. Think that's going to break or change uh, you know the way how we actually do banking. Uh, we still also focus on, you know, let's look at how can we incrementally change, incrementally improve on existing areas as well as uh, introduce new things. You know, uh, for example, I think one of the areas that we were always trying to challenge was to get a, to get EKYC straight up. You know, people have done that everywhere around the world. You know, why not Malaysia? So what, so we pushed through, got it and became the first bank to, for EKYC. So now you can open your account without even uh, going to our branches and then we constantly also look at how do we upskill our people because to change everything means also we also need not just on technology but we also need to change the our organization and people and that's also a, a way of like look you know how do we restructure our training programs how do we continue to introduce even simplest things of putting the idea of like design thinking uh draw all and put it as part of our onboarding process you know how do we put in a job methodologies as well as, uh, you know, getting them to at least be aware of what Agile is, you know, especially to, you know, bankers who who been in like uh, race or compliance, you know, or audit for all these years and then suddenly to say, you know, what, hey, here's something new, here's something different. Let's start, you know, getting them into the mindset. So definitely I agree what Jan says, whatever happened, uh, whatever happens to, you know, companies like you know, the Nokia, the Blackberries and Kodak, it scares the shit out of us. Uh, we don't want to definitely fall into that and but yeah we definitely could work faster and we could definitely you know think broader also as well definitely i i totally agree and i think i think we all agree um based on the the discussion just now we all agree that fintech has clearly has a great potential to change the social economic lives of people across the globe and because of innovation the ir 4.0 the changing customer expectation and the enormous impact on the revenue of the bank themselves this is changing the way the financial services op operate right if not yet like jan mentioned existential crisis will hit them um, Azim and Lawrence rightfully pointed out the need for change, but I also truly believe that banks is looking at redefining themselves, like mentioned by Ganesh and Mark, uh, as they work hard at building innovation capabilities, inventing hardwiring of the practices itself. We also know, we all also know, to scale innovation would require the whole ecosystem to work together, and therefore why we have all the panel here today and so brings me last question as we have only you know the last six minutes um as innovators yourself coming from different type of organization as well as perhaps industry what would your last word be to all that is listening perhaps what could make or break corporate innovation or how could grid and startup work together better Sure, I'll, I'll jump in on that then. Um, I think what That's I recommend yeah. to all my clients is basically in the end, it's going to come down to how much innovation you produce, just quantity matters. Um, and so my rule of thumb is you need to be producing one innovation project per person per year, every year. That innovation project should be worth at least 10,000 US dollars, which is about 40,000 ringgit. So if you have, for example, at a bank, 10,000 people, you need an e innovation ecosystem that can produce 10,000 innovation projects every single year. That is the minimum run rate to keep up and be competitive in industry 4.0. Bear in mind that China speed is two projects per year. And so um, that basically is this fundamental strategic question for all seniors at financial institutions in the next five years. Five years to build that capability. And if you don't get that up by 2025, I don't think you're going to make it. So that's that's basically the KPI. That's what you got to go for. And yep. if you can do that, you can have a really good chance of learning from the lessons of the past and accelerating towards the trillion dollar company because yes. um, that's the opportunity. There's a massive landscape out there and traditional banks in a sense are very well positioned to get there. So let's go for it. I agree. The, um, leverage the wisdom of the crowd and, and use the resources they have and everyone will be able to bring something to the world. Okay, thanks, Yan. But I'll add on uh, so that the bankers can have their say. Uh, my view is to make innovation as boring as possible. Make it a routine. It should not be sexy. It should be you should be focusing on having a good innovation governance system because that's what I feel uh, the way forward. Thank you.
good governance system. That's what you think would actually help the banks to innovate better, yeah. uh, to supply just better to the market. Yeah, just a note. Yeah. There's a new st ISO standard, uh, ISO 56002, ISO for uh, Innovation Management System. We need it so that everybody follows the procedure. We have to innovate. It's in our quality system. We have to. Then people read. Thank you. All right. We hear you, Azim. Thank you. <laughs> Anyone next? Um, it's like almost going we, left. Yeah. <laughs> have we, is the word to the bank first or? Can I, if you want to go? All right. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Lawrence. Um, you know. Lawrence will finish it with the bank. I have a few. These are just one-liners, right? You know, what, what doesn't get measured doesn't get done. You know, it's just a one-liner. Um, another thing is very important. I think this is more for people, right? This is, this is what I face on a day to day, right? People calling me and, and, and they always come to me with challenges and, and these sort of barriers, um, that they face when it comes to innovating. And so my message to everyone that out there, you know, you're stuck in this sort of BAU, you, you have, you know, people above you that might not be so supportive of, of you trying to bring in your new ideas or your new things. Uh, my message to you is, um, you know, stand for something, right? Fight for it. You really believe it. There's no barriers that can place your innovation. Your time, money, resources are just perceived barriers and challenges that you must overcome. If you really stand for something, really believe in it, um, and 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 just remember, every single one of us can be involved in innovation. You know, it's not. It's more than just bucks, right? It it cuts across services, structures, processes, and so on. And and if you want to be a part of changes, how can I make things better in my work on a day-to-day -day level? Right. I mean, I start as small, always start small and focus on incremental uh, change. And don't worry if, if your if your company doesn't have a governance system or you don't have a, a innovation metrics or whatever, then just think about how can I make work better for myself? How can I work, make work better for my team? How can I make work for my customer? You know, and I think you'll be in a good place and innovation will happen. Yeah, that's it. Beautifully spoken. Be the change you want to be, huh? <laughs> yeah. All right. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Ganesh. Uh, Mark. That I guess to add on is don't give up. That's just the one. I think this one line from me: just don't give up. Just be persistent. See it through, and you see change. Yes. It is a very important uh, characteristic, modern behavior in innovation: resilience. Right? To be resilient. Yeah. Thanks, Mark. Last but not least, let's hear it from Lawrence. So yeah, I have to tell you, I'm German, right? So so you don't you're not getting mad at me. Um, so I, I think innovation has to be pain. Um, I, I I very much like what Jan was saying in the beginning. He said you have to dedicate at least ten thousand US per employee and so forth. If you if I would join an organization again in my life, which I would probably not do. But if I do that, I would look at the CEO and I would look, I would only join that organization if that CEO is, is able and willing to dedicate maybe even his own salary, his own time and his own dedication to innovation. Because at the end of the day, uh, as Azim put, put it nicely, it's all about sexy. It's, you know, we have the nice pep talk and we do all of these things. But at the end of the day, not much is happening. Uh, and I think, you know, Jan was saying that earlier, I, I can see this with my client and I understand all the issues that are there. I, I, it, it's humanly sometimes impossible, especially in a structure so rigid, like in a bank with all regulation, all that. I get that. But at the end of the day, nobody will look back and say, oh, I'm so sorry, you have so many regulations to deal with. They will just say, you just failed. And that's what they say at Nokia, at you know, all these different brands. So it's not any leadership in place that's ready to take pain and get people in that are ready to take pain, it's not gonna happen. So, and I think, I mean, if anybody's listening and everybody's kind of deciding to join an organization, be part of it, it's all safe, it's all interesting, but it's pain. Yeah. And that's uh, that's why I said I'm German. You know, the Germans are, I guess, are associated with pain, I guess. To it's painful, extent. but necessary. <laughs> <laughs> this is so critical. I've only seen innovation happening if there is a dedicated leadership that is not taking any for bullshit and it's just going for it and it's, it's, it's even uh, throwing a risk in there and yeah. saying, no, I'm ready, I'm in it. I will I will go to the board and I will argue this. Uh, yeah. If you don't have that, walk away. That's all I can say. And because yeah, sure. it can get frustrating. But there's still hope. Thanks, Lawrence. Thanks, Lawrence. Thank you so much.
everyone to Shanda, all of the speaker. Do you have any last words for the for the audience? <laughs> I think I've learned tremendously a lot from everyone here and I think one of the things that everyone that really hit the spot in my view is the importance of leadership right if and 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 in the importance what I meant by the importance of leadership is that to walk the talk you want the organization to be you know relevant today you want innovation to be in place you must be dedicated you must be committed to actually make that change happen and don't just ask someone for that change but be that change right go into the arena of the people and and pick up the sword and fight with them allocate resources accordingly right put in place the right process and framework and and governance and structure to actually really encourage and incentivize people to look into the future for the organization and for themselves and i think that's my view which is i'm sure align with everyone here and that's the important in leadership and for all of us right whether you have the position of power or not it starts with yourself and therefore be the leader that you want to be that you want to have for yourself right um that's it but nothing more it's almost you know everything hit this the the the, the, the spot L listening from all of you has been such a pleasure for me thank you so much for allowing me to moderate the session and thank, thank you for you everyone much. listening thank you. wonderful thank, thank you, you. Thank have you. a good sunday everyone awesome yeah, session, guys appreciate it right, thank you thank you